Welcome and thank you for joining us. My name is Jennifer Matthews and I'll be your moderator today. One quick thing before we get started, would everyone please grab a sheet of paper and a pen or pencil? These will come in handy later on in the presentation. For those of you new to the Masters of Reliability webinars, our mission is to extend craftsmanship mastery to circuit owners and their contractors to improve reliability. Today's webinar, Neutral Corrosion, is the third in the series. To register for upcoming Masters of Reliability webinars or to view recordings of past webinars, visit Novinium's website and click the webinar graphic on the home page, or you may go directly to the page with the link below. To give you some background on the Masters behind today's presentation, Fern Buchholz has over 25 years of BC Hydro and PowerTech labs. He has experience with power cable failure analysis and condition assessment projects for industries and utilities in the U.S. and Canada. He is a senior member of IEEE Insulated Conductors Committee and is the working group chair on the IEEE 1617 Guide for Detection, Mitigation, and Control of Concentric Neutral Corrosion in Medium Voltage Cables. He is presently a consultant for the Canadian Copper Development Association. Unfortunately, Vern's unable to join us today as he's recovering from a bad bicycle accident. In his place, Nathaniel's very own Glenn Martini will be presenting. Glenn has 25 years in the reliability business gained from three different firms. He has analyzed hundreds of failures from dozens of manufacturers from four continents. He has worked with hundreds of circuit owners and has witnessed good, bad, and ugly craft procedures. Glenn's also a professional chemical engineer and an IEEE fellow. And with that, Glenn, I'd like to turn the floor over to you. Thank you, Jennifer, for the introduction. For those of you who know Vern, I would encourage you to uh, wish him a speedy recovery. He took a very nasty fall on his bike. Vern led the writing team for IEEE 1617, the IEEE guide for the uh, detection, mitigation, and control of concentric neutral corrosion and medium voltage underground cables. And I'm, I was uh, also part of the writing group. In this webinar, we're going to be using that uh, IEEE 1617 as, as kind of an outline, but we'll be adding lots of new information that wasn't available at the time of its publication. Before we begin, let's learn a little bit about our participants today. Please indicate whether you are a circuit owner, um, AV and C are circuit owners, either a line worker, engineer, or reliability management, and D would be a supplier of products or services to the industry, and E is something else. I'll give everyone just a few seconds to answer. Three more seconds. All right, we're going to close the poll. Okay, so we have um, a large number of engineers predominantly from, um, from people that own circuits. Um, we'd love to, love to have seen more line or craft workers present because um, uh, there's going to be lots of information that they'll be able to use. But uh, if you are an engineer for a circuit owner and reliability management, you can uh, direct your uh, folks to this uh, webinar after the fact by watching the video if you find it useful. So here's what our goals are for today, and we have six of them. The first thing we want to do is want to learn why cables have neutrals in the first place. The second goal is from the knowledge of why the neutrals exist, we should be able to deduce the consequences of having neutral corrosion. Our third learning goal will be to seek to understand the chemistry of corrosion in lay terms. I promise I won't kill you with any chemistry, but you will learn some new vocabulary today. For the first time ever, you will see data on the extent of neutral corrosion in North America. And five, we're going to learn how best to detect corrosion. And finally, we'll consider the options to deal with corrosion once discovered. So let's pop right into the uh, purpose of the neutral. And there are four, four identified by IEEE 1617. First, the cable is a giant but inefficient capacitor, and hence charging current is induced on and dissipated by the neutral. Second, in the event of a fault, the neutral provides a direct return path for the fault current to the system protective devices, allowing them to trip as quickly as possible. 
I'm going to skip over IEEE 16.4.3 for a moment. I'll come back to it, though. The third purpose of the neutral is to provide a return current path. For well-balanced multi-phase loads, this current can be quite low. But for single-phase applications, the return current can approach the conductor current. For most common concentric neutral um, ca cables, it's composed of several copper wires concentrically wound in a helix around the insulation shield. However, the neutral can come in a variety of shapes and sizes. Now circling back to 4.3, the fourth purpose of the neutral is to mitigate the consequences of a failure to successfully accomplish the other three purposes. A properly functioning, functioning neutral all but eliminates step potential and touch potential. Step potential is a difference in voltage between two feet, human or animal. Human step potential is low because our footsteps are quite close together, and we usually are wearing shoes with some nominal dielectric properties. Larger animals like cows or horses have a greater distance between their feet, and they don't wear shoes. An ellipsoid of zero potential will form around the damaged neutrals anchored at both vertices by a well-functioning neutral. If the distance between the two well-functioning electrodes is great enough and the soil electrical conductivity is low, the ellipsoid may intersect the surface as depicted here. This hapless cow's hind legs are at zero potential and her front legs have a non-zero potential. If that potential difference is high enough, the cow may suffer some discomfort. Touch potential is voltage on a cable exterior, which is contacted accidentally, as in a digin. Knowing now the four purposes of the neutral, we can get a sense for the consequences if the neutral is compromised. And there are five. First is the loss of the defined path of low impedance for the flow of charging currents. That situation may result in insulation shield capacitive voltage driving currents in unintended paths. These unintended currents may damage the surface of the non-metallic insulation shield with significant heating and erosion of the layer, ultimately exposing the insulation. In such cases, the result is concentrated stress, localized heating, and cable failure. That is precisely what happened with the cable in the center of this frame. A microscopic inspection of the cross-section in the far right image was the result. The pit near the top is where discharges eroded into the insulation layer. The resulting stress enhancement led to the growth of a large water tree. And if you look closely near the bottom of the image, an electrical tree has formed, the last step preceding failure. The other four consequences include that if you lose the neutral, it results in a higher circuit impedance. Protective coordination can suffer, which can in turn result in more extensive damage from a fault. Number three, the loss of significant neutral may result in charging current, fault current, and system neutral current flowing on the conducting path of adjacent metallic facilities. The higher impedance can also present a higher step or touch potential in connection with a dig-in and even with stresses and voltages like in our cow a few moments ago. Number four, significant loss of neutral can result in voltage unbalances due to uneven and elevated impedances in the neutral circuit. These imbalances can result in high voltages, low voltages, or a mixture of both from phase conductors to neutral. Finally, the fifth reason is the national codes, such as the National uh, Electrical Safety Code. They're commonly referred to when considering the requirements associated with a concentric neutral. The NSEC does not specifically discuss the neutral, but it does discuss concepts such as insulation shielding and effective grounding. It was the consensus of the IEEE 1617 writing group that when a cable shield uh, fails significantly, it's no longer considered functional if, it's exp if it has experienced extensive neutral corrosion. If you are a circuit owner, um, please don't answer the following question. But if you are a circuit owner, uh, please um, uh, tell us which of the following best describes your perception of the causes of URD circuit failures at your firm? Is it cable on the top, A, or is it components on the bottom, E, or somewhere in between some, some mix of cable and component failures? Please take a moment and uh, make your choice. And again, if you um, are not a circuit owner, please don't answer.
give everyone a few more seconds. And I'm going to close the polls now. So predominantly, people uh, find that they have cable failures. And um, about uh, uh, the next highest number is uh, uh, component, uh, even mix of cable and component failures. And tied with that is um, uh, predominantly component failures with cable failures. And there are a few that have 100% component failures, I mean, sorry, cable failures, and none that um, have 100% um, component failures. The, the paper that um, the following graph comes from is um, available publicly. And it was presented at the uh, Chicago Conference in Versailles, France in, at 2007. And it's some neat track data. And they polled uh, over 20 circuit owners. And they determined what uh, the same question, basically. What were the causes of the failures? And for example, uh, circuit owner number 21 found that they had predominantly cable failures, whereas circuit owner number four on the right side had predominantly component failures. And so that um, is fairly similar to our audience's experience. If you average all those together, you get about 39% accessory failures and about 55% cable failures and about 6% unknown. Let's talk about cable failures for a moment. And, and let's ask another question. If you own cables, which of the following best describes your perception of the predominant cause of cable failures at your firm? And again, if, you're, if you don't own, own cables, please don't vote. But if you own cables, is it neutral corrosion, A, insulation failure, B, uh, generally from water tree degradation, manufacturing defect, C, or physical damage, D, or some other cause not indicated? We'll give it just a few more seconds if everybody can get their votes in. All right, looks like everyone's finished. So um, not too surprisingly, um, most people found that about 3 quarters of the problems are associated with water tree degradation. And neutral corrosion uh, got an 8% number here, and then frost damage and critter damage are bring up the next, the third place position there. Let's check out briefly, and uh, those that are interested, there's a, a, a long paper on the subject, but um, what, what is the cause of electrical failure in power cables? In this study, Dr. Stinas looked at the relationship between water tree length and reliability. And we found basically about a 78% correlation coefficient. That means 78% of the um, variation in the results in these field age cables in their AC breakdown strength was explainable by the largest water tree present. So that validates the results that we saw from our poll a few moments ago. The, um, if we take the, that polling data and we take Dr. Stinas's results, we can begin to dimension the size of the problem here. The vast majority of issues are associated with water trees, um, components bring up the second place, and then we have a whole host of potential other issues that represent something less than 14% of the overall population of failures. What part of that 14% is a result of neutral corrosion? I can tell you from a, a study, because we've systematically tested millions of feet of cable all around North America and the world, that we only see significant neutral corrosion in about 5% of the population of cables. My personal experience spans 25 years at a total of three reliability firms. And this general pattern has been consistent throughout that period. We will dive further into that data later in this webinar, but for now, Let's consider what causes neutral corrosion for some insights into why the incidence is so very low. There are five causes identified in IEEE 1617. The first is galvanic corrosion, and it involves the flow of positive ions off the surface of the metal at the anode. These ions typically combine with negative ions existing in the environment at the surface of the anode to form an oxide. 
corresponding to the loss of positive ions from the surface of the metal is the release of negative electrons. These electrons flow in the metal toward the anode region, away from the cathode region, where they can combine with positive ions existing in the environment. Each metal or alloy has a characteristic electrochemical potential. When you arrange these metals uh, by that potential, you get the galvanic series shown here. In the chart, the most anodic materials are on the top, and the most cathodic materials are on the bottom. If, for example, you bond copper neutral to the steel rebar of a vault, the copper will not suffer galvanic corrosion. The steel will. Copper is very cathodic and is unlikely to be connected to stainless steel, silver, gold, or platinum. The more anodic materials will, in fact, sacrifice themselves to protect or mitigate corrosion on their cathodic bonded cousins. We'll come back to sacrificial anodes later in this webinar, but notice that magnesium and zinc are on the top of the anodic list. And these are the materials of choice for sacrificial anodes. There are four other causes enumerated by 1617. Number two is the corrosion of a single piece of metal occurs when there's microscopic potential differences on its surface from de defects such as mill scale or scratches. Each of these locations will have a slightly different potential. The third potential cause is when a cable passes through two different soil types, for example, acidic to alkaline soil. The fourth is differences in soil oxygen content, re which results in potential differences, electrical voltage differences. A bare cable passing from a clay soil of poor aeration into a gravel soil of greater aeration will form a differential aeration corrosion cell, with the soil of low oxygen content becoming anodic. Another common situation that causes differential aeration is where a cable goes into a conduit for a short run, such as under a street. The fifth uh, cause are stray electrical currents, which are typically from nearby DC sources, such as welding generators, impressed current, cathodic protection systems operating on adjacent foreign structures, transit systems, and so forth. Uh, th those voltages can be impressed upon the neutral. Each of these five corrosion causes require five elements to occur, and they must have all five elements. The first is there has to be a chemical potential which induces a relative positive charge. That's called the anode. The second is chemical potential nearby that induces a relative negative charge. That's called the cathode. C, the neutral, must still be intact so that you can carry electricity between the anode and the cathode, electrons specifically. And D, the soil has to be moist in order to allow ions to be transported through the soil. And finally, there has to be uh, oxidizing agent nearby, such as oxygen or elemental sulfur. The concentration of oxygen is something I want to chat about just briefly, because it declines as you go deeper. This is because plants and animals use the oxygen as it diffuses from the atmosphere, where it's, of course, ubiquitous. Worms, insects, plants, bacteria, and fungi extract oxygen from the soil. There's good news and bad news about this. The good news is that lower oxygen concentrations reduce the rate of corrosion. The bad news is that the reduction with depth is not likely to be uniform. Differences in aeration along a cable length may lead to corrosion by differential aeration mechanism. The depth at which the soil becomes anaerobic varies widely. In wetlands, it often occurs within inches of the surface. In grassy uplands, the boundary may be several meters deep. If a cable passes from a wetland into an upland, Differential aeration is almost a certainty. To understand the impact of oxygen on degradation mechanisms, consider that the extinction of mastodons occurred almost 11,000 years ago. Yet excavations of their corpses sometimes yield virtually intact organs and other soft tissue. The reason that these soft tissues remain intact is because they are found in anaerobic soil. That's science speak for swamps, bogs, and shorelines. Just as anaerobic conditions protect ancient remains of these hairy beasts, they also protect bare concentric neutrals buried in swamps and near marine estuaries when the whole of the cable lies in stable anaerobic conditions. Returning to our five identified causes, let's focus on the really important ones. Galvanic corrosion only occurs where copper is bonded to a more cathodic metal. This just does not really occur. Number two, Single metal corrosion occurs, but it's really insignificant because it results in minor pitting of the neutral. Focusing on five, 
Stray currents are rare, except around definable man-made objects. Active cathodic protection of pipelines, electrified trains, welding shops. They're easy to identify. So three and four, soil corrosion and differential aeration, are the main drivers for significant neutral corrosion. And here are two hints that you can use. First of all, to avoid soil corrosion, use native backfill on pit restoration. Secondly, sorry. Secondly, to avoid um, to avoid differential aeration, use native backfill and compact it so that there's the same amount of oxygen in the in the in the backfill as there is in the native soil. Now that you understand how neutral corrosion works, let's see if we can surmise how neutral corrosion progresses with time. Imagine that you excavated a cable after 20 years in service, and that 40% of the neutral was gone. So we have two data points. We have when it was brand new, it had 0% corrosion, and 20 years later, it had 40% corrosion. Which of the following three curves do you think likely shows the progression of neutral corrosion with time? Is it A, linear? Is it B, increasing slope? Or is it C, a decreasing slope? So Jennifer is going to put the, uh, the choice up there, linear increasing slope or decreasing slope? What do you think? We will not put individual names against each choice. Just a few more seconds on that so you can get your answers in now. The last ones, and I'm going to close the poll. A significant majority of the um, individuals think that the slope will increase with time. The the next is decreasing slope, and about 10% of the folks think that it's linear. So let's let's talk about the chemistry. And again, I'm not going to kill you with chemistry, but let's talk a little bit about the chemistry of how these reactions occur. Imagine for a thought experiment that you have shiny new neutrals freshly buried. The soil on the left is slightly acidic. The soil on the right is slightly alkaline. The difference in hydrogen ion availability establishes a potential difference between the right and the left, an anode and a cathode. There is a metallic connection between the anode and the cathode. It's the brand new neutral. So we've met the, the third requirement, requirement C. The soil, we're going to assume, is wet, which facilitates the transport of ions through the soil. So we've met the fourth requirement, D. But the soil's not so wet that it's anaerobic. There is some oxygen present. If the potential difference between the anode and the cathode is greater than the electrochemical threshold for the oxidation of copper, corrosion will begin. The rate of corrosion is determined by the flow of electrons in this loop. And uh, that's, that's I. The current I equals the voltage E between the anode and the cathode divided by R, the resistance of the loop. This, of course, is Ohm's law. Let's examine the factors that determine the electrical potential, the numerator of this equation. First, there's no oxidation unless the E is greater than the threshold required to drive the electrochemical reaction. If the potential is not high enough, there will be no reaction. Second. The flow of current, if present, reduces the alkalinity of the soil on the right and reduces the acidity of the soil on the left. This is like a battery. There's only so much electrical chemical potential. Using the battery depletes its charge. To recharge the battery requires new molecules from outside the system to provide fresh fuel. For differential aeration, the fresh fuel is oxygen diffusing into the soil or conduit. For non-differential aeration cases, Somebody has to keep adding chemicals, such as fertilizer, to refuel the battery. Aside from these recharging cases, the E is going to decline over time. That means that the rate of corrosion will decline over time. Third, even if there were no current flow at all, the second law of thermodynamics, or entropy, would work to equalize the hydrogen ion concentration in the soil. Excess protons in the acidic soil would be transported to the alkaline soil. A battery discharges itself even without a load. Entropy causes the voltage to decline over time. 
What about the denominator of our equation? What impacts the resistance? When the copper neutral is shiny and new, there's very little resistance between the copper and wet, compacted soil. However, as the corrosion occurs, a thin layer of typically green copper oxide and copper carbonates form. We see the lovely patina on the copper neutral along the left border of the screen. These copper oxides and copper carbonates are not conductive. Their formation increases the resistance of our loop. An increase in the denominator of our equation decreases the current, I, and hence the rate of corrosion. In addition to its resistance to the flow of electrons, it also impedes the transport of oxygen to the native copper below, reducing the electrochemical potential. If the potential drop difference drops below enough, uh, enough of a low level, corrosion will cease entirely. Finally, there is the resistance of the neutral itself. As the neutral is consumed, the resistance of the, of the loop increases. When individual strands are severed, the corrosion on those strands all but stops. This is why neutral corrosion is a consistently confined phenomenon. When we excavate neutral corrosion sites, the damage to the neutral is most typically concentrated within just a couple of feet. All five of these factors reduce the rate of corrosion as time advances. I want to refine the definition of patina for a moment, and then we'll return to the neutral corrosion causes for the conduit case. The patina is a thin crust that forms on the surface of many metals. In the case of copper, there are a variety of oxides, hydroxides, and carbonates. The colors can range from the familiar blue-green to black and red. This microscopic sample of a neutral taken from service has all three side by side. All are non-conductive and all inhibit the transfer of oxidizers to the surface of the native copper underneath. The patina is stable. Copper roofs installed in the middle of the last millennium in Europe endured unscathed well into the 20th century until the widespread burning of high sulfur coal led to acid rain. Acid dissolves copper carbonate. Acid soils dissolve carbon, copper carbonate too. Let's consider for a moment the case of a cable in a polymeric conduit. In the illustration, we consider uh, the case where there's a dip in the conduit, which is partially flooded with water. The illustration is a simplification of the real world conditions because the water is not going to be clean. In fact, each time water enters the conduit, it carries silt and sediments. Those solids tend to settle in the low spots in the annular space between the cable and the conduit. This silting can sometimes interfere with cable removal, but that's not what we're interested in right now. We're interested in the silt because it provides an important equivalent to soil in a direct buried case. If a bare concentric neutral cable were in a perfectly clean plastic conduit, there would not be an environment for ionic transport outside of the puddle, and hence there could be no corrosion. The silted conduit bottom wicks water against gravity outside of the puddle and potentially provides an environment for water and ion, a requirement for macroscopic corrosion to occur. Let's blow up the right side of this illustration to take a closer look at what might be happening. The corrosion mechanism is identical to the direct buried case, except that because the water level changes with the seasons, the anode and the cathode move with those seasons as well. Corrosion is likely to be more distributed along the length of cable than in the direct buried case. So now that we have an understanding of the chemistry involved, we, can, we know now that the correct answer to that earlier query was C. The rate of corrosion for the predominant cause of neutral corrosion decreases with time. Every single dynamic factor leads to either a decrease in the driving force or to an increase in the resistance. This conclusion is further supported by 25 years of experience assessing the neutral condition of over 100 million feet of cable. There is no materially significant trend toward increasing neutral corrosion. One of the bright young minds from our reliability masters here at Novinium is Corey Torgerson. He's been carefully watching your questions and uh, we're going to take a moment for a couple questions. Okay, well, Glenn, we have uh, actually lots of great questions from the audience. Um, unfortunately, we will not have time to get to all of them on this during this webinar, but we'll go over as many as we can. So our first uh, question is from Don, and he wants to know why cables were originally installed without jackets. Is, is there a grounding benefit to this, or did they just not uh, think it was an issue? Well, that's a great question, Don. The, the, 
the first thing was they're obviously cheaper to install without jackets, so there was an economic uh, consideration there. And the people at the time believed that the copper patina that we talked about would protect the neutrals uh, for a very, very long time. So they, they really hadn't done their homework, though, and, and looked at the different uh, conditions that cables might be in. On the other side of that, though, is that the fact is that 95% of those neutrals installed 40 and 50 years ago are still in service, providing reliable service. So it mostly did work. Uh, Doug is asking about uh, whether the concerns with neutral corrosion apply the same to jacketed cables as unjacketed, or do jackets largely mitigate the problem? It's, uh, that's actually a very good question also, and it's a complicated one. And, uh, and I, I thought about including some of that information in this, but in an hour you just can't uh, go over every single case. So when you, as soon as you talk about jackets, you have various kinds of jackets, like encapsulated jackets and non-encapsulated jackets. And in, in general, if a jacket uh, does its job, it keeps the water away from the, the copper and it reduces the rate of uh, oxygen getting to the copper and so forth. So in, in general, it's going to reduce the rate of corrosion. However, if the jackets get damaged and they let water in, it can actually exasperate the situation. So there's lots of different cases, and there's just not one simple answer. But uh, maybe the big broad brush view is that jackets generally improve the integrity of the neutrals. Uh, we have a question from Chris. He wants to know what effect the geometry of the neutrals has on corrosion. So do cables with more smaller wires, like an angel hair, tend to suffer from corrosion worse than cables that have fewer larger wires to get the same size neutral? Well, it, it would be true that smaller bleed wire type uh, conductors would have a much larger surface area per unit um, volume of conductor uh, or of neutral conductor. So they would theoretically be more susceptible to corrosion than the larger ones. But also, when those really small wires are used, they usually were used in jacketed cables. I, I can't think of a case where the bleed wires were in a non-jacketed cable. So, but yes, the, the bigger the wire, the, the less susceptible it would be to corrosion in general. So um, those are great questions. Keep them coming. And I just want to mention really quickly that um, even if we get 150 questions, we will answer them all uh, by email or on a blog later on. So keep the questions coming, and, and Corey will, will keep looking at those. Um, now I've got another kind of a quiz for you, and you need that piece of paper that Jennifer mentioned in the beginning because I want you to write down one, two, three, and four down aside, and then you're going to put a check next to um, the one, two, three, and four because I'm going to show you four pictures. And the question is, is there evidence of neutral corrosion on this cable number one? So put a check next to number one if the answer is, is yes, that there is evidence. Uh, same question on number two. Is there evidence of neutral corrosion on this jacketed URD cable? Same question on number three. Uh, is there evidence of corrosion on this helictically wrapped tape, also jacketed cable? And finally, the fourth picture. And here I give you a little bit of evidence. You might need to look carefully. Some green copper to carbonate um, up there in the upper right-hand corner. And so the same question is, is there evidence? So Jennifer will um, now let you take your four answers and enter them into the um, poll. We'll give everyone a little bit longer for this one. We have over 100 participants uh, today. And I, I really want to encourage people, if they find the information useful in here, to uh, pass it on to their colleagues and have them uh, register and, and watch this video after the fact. OK, just a couple more seconds, and then we'll close the poll. And so people clearly understood the last one had a corrosion problem, especially with the hint. Um, but uh, people couldn't see evidence. Uh, some people couldn't see the evidence uh, in the first three cases, typically 30 or, or 20 or 30 percent. Um, all, all four of those have evidence of mutual corrosion. You probably thought it was a trick question, though, those that didn't uh, answer. 
because uh, here is the question you might have been answering. Does the corrosion interfere with the purpose of the neutral? So now I want you to give me four new checks. And now that we understand the purpose of the neutral, we're not saying is there neutral corrosion, but rather does this corrosion interfere with the purpose of the neutral? And we have the same uh, four pictures. And if you f it, just to be reminded, here are the four um, purposes of the neutral. So put a check mark next to the bleed wires if you think that it interferes. Put a check mark next to number two if you think that that level of corrosion interferes with those purposes. Put a check mark next to number three if you think that that corrosion interferes with the, th the four purposes. And finally, here's our last guy, the URD with holes in the shield. Put a check mark next to that one. And again, let's, let's take a, a quick uh, a vote. Just a couple more seconds if you can finish up with your votes. And I'm closing the polls now. Well, yes, it was fairly obvious that the, uh, the one with the holes in it was definitely an issue. And uh, in terms of the other three, we've got about roughly a third of, of each case um, somebody thinking that it interferes with the purposes of the neutral, and uh, two-thirds thinking that it's not. The, the point um, that I was trying to make with those two polls is that we often ask our line personnel or technicians to determine if the neutral is corroded when they fill out a failure ticket. And of course, it almost always is corroded. So that's what the people check. What we should be asking is, is the corrosion of the neutral of sufficient severity to have caused this fault or caused some other problem in the cable? And of course, in order to be able to answer that question, they need to understand material that we have just discussed, which is one really good reason to have your line personnel watch this uh, the video of this uh, webinar after the fact. Now let's uh, change subjects a little bit. And, and let's, let me ask you, which of the following best explains why neutral corrosion might be overreported? Okay, just a few seconds left on that one. And I'm closing the poll now. So the favorite answer was all of the above. That was my answer as well. Now let's turn our attention to an assessment of the significance of neutral corrosion. This is an intriguing map produced by the United States Department of Agriculture using its extensive soil survey data. The map was prepared for ground penetrating radar, and the properties selected to prepare this map include clay content and mineralogy, electrical conductivity, sodium absorption ratio, calcium carbonate levels, and calcium sulfate content. In future work, we will be using this USDA data set, which includes dozens of other parameters, to geospatially correlate actual incidents of neutral corrosion with soil properties. I know for sure that perfect correlation is not possible because corrosion is an inherently local phenomena, and the USDA database will never have one meter granularity. However, I believe the exercise will be fruitful because, as you will see momentarily, there are certain soil types that seem to be particularly forgiving. Those within the forgiving soil types may appreciate the solace that they get from this uh, exercise. Going around the clock and starting on the eastern seaboard, the corrosion levels are slightly higher than the national average in the regions that are particularly suitable for, GP, uh, for GPR uh, you know, radar. In, um, as we move to the southeast, Florida has a substantially higher corrosion level, which you'd expect from the color, and uh, Mississippi has a much lower than the national average. In the southwest, Texas and Colorado are below the mean, while Arizona is right at the mean. In the heartland, Missouri and Iowa experience very low corrosion rates. In the northwestern United States, 
the coastal states suffer corrosion rates above the norm. Idaho is near the norm, and Montana is well below the norm. Again, correlating fairly well with the uh, GPRS survey data. In the north central states, most areas are at or below the norm, except Indiana suffers an anomalously high corrosion rate. Of course, all corrosion is local, so this kind of macro view is inherently flawed. Differential aeration can and does occur anywhere, so soil properties cannot be a perfect predictor of corrosion potential. Nonetheless, the USDA data and models have exquisite granularity, and our corrosion data has a resolution of better than 100 meters. I intend to attempt a geospatial correlation of soil properties to the incidence of neutral corrosion so that we can have a predictive model that we can share with the industry. I suspect that such a model might be able to predict up to 50% of the variation, but that the majority of the variation will not be able to be ascribed to soil chemistry models. Time and analysis are required. We haven't forgotten our friends north of the 48th parallel. The trend we saw in the U.S. Pacific Northwest may extend into British Columbia, but at least in Alaska, Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Ontario, neutral corrosion is almost non-existent. In 1994, the ICC task force that was a forerunner of the IEEE 1617 writing effort published a seven-year survey of circuit owner reported neutral problems. There was a five-year period where that survey overlapped with a similar survey called the AEIC Cable Report. In this table, we put the two reports side by side and compare the reported incidences of cable failure to reported incidents of neutral problems. The ratio of, this, uh, of these two failure rates is about 10 to 1. Neutral corrosion is at least 10 times less significant than cable failures. This table, by the way, was published in t and World Magazine in 1996 by Bob Gurniak of Pennsylvania Power and Light. Turning our attention next to detecting neutral corrosion, 1617 lists four methods. The first method, visual inspection, is inherently qualitative and can only be applied to exposed cable. Reliance on visual inspection alone is very likely to underdiagnose or overdiagnose uh, corrosion. 7.2 is a time domain reflectometer, or TDR. It's the most widely used method. It can find precisely where neutrals are damaged. It cannot recognize modest degradation below about 25%. In practice, though, the levels of degradation below 25% do not materially impact cable operation. The third uh, choice is resistance measurements. They can work. They can be applied on energized cables. They cannot pinpoint corrosion issues. The fourth choice are surface voltage measurements that have been used but never became commercially significant. The reason that they never became commercially significant is that they're quite tedious. That is, surface voltage measurements are not economical. Fifteen years ago, in a side-by-side -side blind test of the OhmCheck device pictured here, and a TDR performed at Georgia Tech's knee track, both devices provided equivalent results, except the TDR was also able to pinpoint actual corrosion sites. The OhmCheck device is currently not commercially available. For the balance of this section on detection, we're going to focus on the TDR, which performs more than 99% of all neutral corrosion survey work. A brief description of how a TDR works is included in that 1617 document. However, a thorough step-by-step -step explanation of how to use a TDR is described public publicly on my firm's website at the long URL on the bottom of the page, or a quicker way to get there would just be to search for the Novinium NRI-12. The TDR transmits a narrow, low-voltage pulse down a coaxial cable. The pulse is less than 20 volts high and has a width of between 1 and 50 nanoseconds. The pulse travels about half the speed of light. A device called an impedance streamliner facilitates a smooth transition from the impedance of the RG coaxial cable to various coaxial power cables. The streamline transition minimizes the reflection attenuation and dispersion of the signal as it enters the subject cable. The use of a streamliner improves the sensitivity and accuracy of the measurement. Where splices are present in the cable, a characteristic S wave is formed. Impedance includes resistance, capacitance, and inductance. In the case of a splice, the neutrals are trained away from the conductor, which reflects a positive wave because the impedance increases. The subsequent negative wave is a result of the neutrals returning to position 
closer to the conductor, which of course decreases the impedance. Where the neutral corrosion uh, is, the resistance increases and the capacitance decreases, but the former dominates and a positive wave is created. The capacitance effect is generally too small to observe, but experienced operators can see it as a small uh, decrease uh, in some cases. Finally, at the far end of the cable, ground is applied and the resistance is close to zero. The TDR will provide a distance determination to the corrosion position and the extent of the corrosion using the relative to height of the reflections as shown in Table 1 of P1617. So if you take a look at the size of that corrosion and compare it to Cable 1, you'll see that the height of the neutral corrosion pulse is less than that of a typical splice, so the neutral corrosion level is 2. To pinpoint the precise location of corrosion, a radio frequency tone is applied to the conductor, and the return tone is urged onto the neutrals with a jumper as shown at termination 2. Much of the resulting electromagnetic field is canceled when the neutrals are in good condition. This occurs because the neutral return is 180 degrees out of phase with the conductor supply. Of course, where neutral wires are broken, this cancellation is compromised, and as a consequence, the neutral corrosion location sings loudly. An operator with a receiver walking over the cable can pinpoint the precise location of the corroded neutral. The equipment and procedures for doing this are also available in NRI 12, which we gave you the reference to earlier. It's, a, it's useful to pinpoint the location of corrosion because it's possible to repair the corrosion. IEEE 1617 has basically two suggestions to address neutral corrosion. The first choice is to repair and provide cathodic protection to the neutral. The second choice is to replace the cable. We're not going to talk about replacement right now because that's pretty straightforward. We are going to talk briefly about how to actually perform the uh, repair. A pit is excavated over the corrosion site. Normally, the corrosion site is just a few feet long. New neutrals are wrapped tightly around the cable and clamped into place with a special clamping hardware. The clamps also have dedicated lead to a sacrificial magnesium anode. The anode is uh, bedded in bentonite clay with a linen bag. Normally, when cathodic protection is applied to protect underground structures, placement of a sacrificial anode requires much consideration. But when doing a neutral repair of a decades-old cable, the optimum location has already been determined for us by history and reinforced with the disturbance of the soil required to excavate the pit. A post hole digger or auger is used to get the anode several feet away from the repair site. The bag can be placed at a depth below the cable at the same depth as the cable or anywhere in between. So I hope that what we've learned is the purpose of the neutral, the four purposes, what happens if there's excessive corrosion, it causes problems with coordination, potentially um, quality issues with our electrical delivery, safety issues, and, uh, and potentially even faults in rare cases. We also learned that the causes, the true primary causes of neutral corrosion are differential aeration and differences in soil chemistry along the length of the cable but that all kinds of corrosion decrease over time. The next thing that we learned is that overall, and it doesn't apply to every single um, state or every single locality, but the overall significance of neutral corrosion on bare concentric neutral cables is pretty small. That it's pretty simple to detect that corrosion, and it's possible to, to detect and correct the corrosion once it's discovered. In, in addition to this webinar, there's other resources that are available to you that I want to share with you. One um, is if you, after this webinar is over, if you fill out a survey, you will receive a companion paper which has all the information we discussed plus lots more. So it's a companion white paper. Also listed here are the detailed procedures, URLs to those detailed procedures on how to find neutral corrosion and to re repair it. The other place that I would call your attention to is a, a blog where we talk about um, all kinds of cable reliability problems, including neutral corrosion. And even though it's, it's written by a frog, I would encourage you to, to look there and look uh, for information on neutral corrosion and other reliability issues. IEEE 1617 itself is available from IEEE Explore. And another upcoming event about two months from now is we'll have a paper presented at the ICC and Subcommittee C that covers uh, even more of the territory that we covered today. And finally, in 2013, there will be e-learning courses available on our e-learning website 
on how to use a TDR, how to find neutral corrosion, how to repair neutral corrosion, and so forth. With that, um, Corey is going to ask some more excellent questions. Okay, so we, we do have a few more from the audience here, Glenn. Um, the first comes from Christina, and what she wants to know is, uh, is there a way of determining the remaining life or the expected remaining life of neutrals uh, once the corrosion is discovered, similar to how insulation works with diagnosis? Well, one sort of simple way, uh, going back to, um, uh, I want to go back to a, a slide from uh, a little, a little bit earlier here, if I could pull that one up, is we, we now know that the curve decreases with time. So if you look at the extent of corrosion at a certain number of years in service, say you're at year 30, and you've got 25% corrosion, you know that over the course of the next 30 years that the amount of corrosion will be less than 25%. So um, it'd be, in other words, 25% plus 25% will be less than 50% total. So that's a, a a, a way to sort of um, subjectively extrapolate into the future. Of course, the, the second thing that one can do is excavate the corroded site, repair it, and drop the sacrificial anode. And then, frankly, even a small anode, they, they come in like eight pound magnesium anode, is going to last for decades and decades, more like 40 or 50 years uh, if you do that. So those are the two, the two ways to sort of predict the future. Okay, uh, we have another question from Brian who wants to know if the TDR is a reliable means of de determining neutral corrosion on submarine cables. Ah, well, the, uh, the, the, the requirement for um, any neutral is that it be um, concentric and not be a helictically wrapped tape because helictically wrapped copper tape have really, really high attenuation, and you can't see very far onto a really long cable length. So if you have an arrangement similar to a typical URD cable with, with concentric neutrals, then the answer is yes. But if you have um, a separate neutral, which also is common in some submarine cables, um, then the answer is no. And if you have uh, the taped, the sort of uh, helically wrapped uh, copper tapes, those also are not uh, cannot be readily assessed with a TDR. Uh, we have a question from Terry regarding um, electrical loading and temperature and how that would affect neutral corrosion. So if we change the load on a cable and increased it, would we expect the neutral corrosion to increase because we had a higher temperature due to more neutral current? Well, gr great, great question, uh, Terry. <clears throat> Whether or not there's a lot of neutral currents not even that important because the conductor itself is going to warm and it's, oh, it's going to warm the whole area around the cable. And um, except for the few chemical engineer types that are on the line, a lot of people might not know that every chemical reaction increases as the temperature goes up. So to the extent that there's any corrosion occurring, warmer temperatures are going to increase that rate of corrosion. However, if the copper is being protected by a patina, um, then the corrosion wouldn't be occurring anyway. So it, it probably um, doesn't have a big impact on it. But if it's in, in, in actively engaged in corrosion at the moment that it's warmed up, then that corrosion will accelerate. Uh, we have another one about uh, thermal backfill. This one comes from David. Um, how do we use thermal backfill when that would conflict with using native soils? So, um, well, if you, what you want is you want to have consistency along the entire length of the cable. So if you use thermal backfill, make sure you use it on 100% of the cable. Don't just uh, put it in, in one spot. Um, another thing that you could do is if you had to imagine that you had some place where two cables crossed and you had a concern about higher temperatures at that point, so you wanted to install thermal backfill just in the cable crossing then you should install sacrificial anodes right at those interfaces because the corrosion is going to occur right at the interface. And so installing a sacrificial anode there will solve that problem for you. So we have another one from uh, Adrian who wants to know if we can do RF detection to identify neutral corrosion in submarine cables in the sea, basically. Well, so radio frequency is attenuated really um, quickly by water, and it's attenuated even quicker by salt water. Um, so it would be a nice, if you could just 
drive along the surface with a boat and, and do that. But if the water depth is more than just a foot or two, um, the signal is going to be extraordinarily weak. So I don't think it's going to be practical, but it's a good question that would deserve some more attention because you know you can always ink boost the signal strength perhaps. And the other possibility is if you could drag um, a remotely operated vehicle or something along the cable path, you might be able to get close enough that you could uh, reduce that attenuation. So it's an interesting idea that I hadn't uh, thought of before and uh, certainly has some possibilities, but there would definitely be challenges associated with it as well. Uh, so we have a question about whether we can do a TDR diagnosis of a cable um, with the cable energized. There aren't any commercially available instruments that can do that today, but there's a, there's, it's theoretically possible to do that. The, actually, the main reason why that device doesn't exist is because there's not enough demand, uh, in other words, no, the people that make the devices couldn't make enough money by making such a device. So it's not, not particularly challenging to do from an electronics perspective, but there's just not enough demand to justify actually developing such a device. Um, Mike has a question about if the neutrals are corroded, will this cause higher electrical stresses in the insulation, and does this always lead to cable failure? So actually, could you ask that again? So uh, the question is, if the neutrals are corroded, do we get higher localized stresses in the cable's insulation? Well, so it doesn't take very much conductor to dissipate those capacitive charges. And because um, they're, 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 they're literally in the micro, you know, ampere sort of range. And when the conductor shield is operating properly, it's probably sufficient to dissipate those capacitive charges. I think where when we had that that beautiful example of a failure in in, um, in uh, early on that I'll just put back up on the screen here. Um, it's never easy to find them when I'm looking for them. These are the exceptions rather than the um, the norm. So I think what has to happen is I think you have to have an insulation shield feel failure at the same time, because the 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 semiconducting material that's the insulation shield should be able to dissipate those charges. And only when it's not are you getting this um, partial discharging occurring or these flashes occurring on the outside that then erode through that, that insulation shield. This is a beautiful set of pictures and a beautiful example thanks to Cable Technology Laboratories. It's the only one, uh, I'm sorry, I've seen one other. I've seen two in my entire life uh, where this is the cause of failure. So it's a very rare cause of failure. And so I don't think it's a normal case. But the direct answer to your question is yes. It's, it's theoretically possible that you could have local uh, voltage imbalances because of the loss of the neutral, and that could um, lead to failure. Uh, I guess our final question would be, does, uh, does the anodic protection system that we have work for materials used in neutrals other than copper? So if we have, for example, a uh, a PILC or even an aluminum neutral, is this going to be something beneficial? I haven't seen a lot of aluminum neutrals myself. I, well, I guess I did see one in, uh, in Poland once. Um, so let me see if I can pull up our Galenic series here um, on the screen. We have aluminum and lead. And uh, they, they both fall below the, um, uh, in the galvanic series to magnesium and zinc. So both aluminum and lead are things that could be protected with a sacrificial anode, such as a magnesium anode. So the answer is, is yes, you could uh, protect those as well. So I, I, you know, I'd like to thank everybody um, for your excellent questions and your participation. And again, I would encourage people to um, fill out the um, uh, survey afterwards, and uh, you'll get, within a couple days, uh, a white paper. We may incorporate some of the questions uh, that we've heard today into that white paper, which is why we might need a day or two to just update it. And then um, we'll get that out to you early next week. And also, uh, really would love to have line personnel be invited to watch this uh, presentation so that uh, we can get this knowledge out into the, uh, into the people that touch the cables the most. Thank you very much. Have a nice day.